This podcast is brought to you by Crisp. It is a software that automatically mutes background noise in any communication app. No more embarrassing dog barks, traffic noises, crying babies, and family chatters when you're doing your calls from home or the nearby cafe. With Crisp, those noises will be muted and your caller will not be able to hear any of them. Not only is it able to remove background noises, it can also even remove the ones coming from your caller. So all you get is high-quality audio without the distractions. Crisp supports any devices and over 800 apps such as Zoom, Teams and WebEx. Try out the world's best AI-powered noise-cancelling technology for free. Simply go to adriantan.com.sg slash crisp to get started. Hey everyone, welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Adrian Tan. On this show, I interview leaders and experts on how they are enabling the future of work and turn their insights into practical advices so that you'll be ready for the future of work. If you're new to the show, I have episodes with mindfulness coach, HR tech vendors, HR leaders, and many more. The staffing market in the APEC region is a US $100 billion industry, and yet it is laden with pain points, especially in the recruitment of tech talent. According to research by Robert Walters, 68% of tech hiring managers surveyed in Southeast Asia said it took more than three months to fill an open tech position on their team. As the tech talent crunch intensifies in Asia, companies need to re-engineer their talent acquisition strategy and further develop their ability to attract high-quality talent. My guest today, Paul Endicott, has almost two decades of experience in the field of recruitment and executive search. He recently found a grit in February 2020 to resolve the inefficiencies and high costs associated with traditional recruitment services. In our discussion, we talk about what has changed in the war for talent, especially since COVID has come into the picture, as well as why the infusion of technology tools and different platforms has yet to narrow the time to fill for all these tech positions. And lastly, at a national level, what can Singapore do better? to ensure that the gap between the supply and demand of such talent could be brought closer. Hi, Paul. Thank you for coming on to the podcast. Hi, Adrian. Thanks for having me here. I'm very happy to be speaking with you today to help our audience understand more about the recruitment landscape, especially in Singapore. The staffing market in Singapore, APEC region, is definitely huge. And as part of this industry for some time before, I do understand the kind of challenges and pain points that people have. We've been talking about the war on talent for the longest time. And how has things changed from your perspective since your first day in recruitment to what you're doing today, especially what COVID has brought to the market? It's an interesting question. I mean, when, when you say how things changed, I think in terms of recruitment processes, they're, they're still quite similar, to be frank, in terms of how people go out and source. Although, obviously, as everything has moved a lot more online and digital and, and LinkedIn certainly really captured a, a large part of the market share for that. And so I, I think one of the interesting things is there's potentially a lot more transparency in the market than when I first went into recruitment. And I mean by that is we used to place adverts, right, back in, 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 in newspapers back in sort of 2001, 2002 to reach out to talent and, and then you obviously go through those applications that you received. I think with obviously open job boards, the likes of LinkedIn, the talent out there is much more transparent. So the challenge now is is really engaging that talent as opposed to waiting for applicants. One way that a lot of people can infer how old I am is when I tell them when I started recruiting, I was still using the fax machine to send CVs right, out. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. so I, I believe you fall into that era as well. <laughs> just about, yeah. No, just about. I think I, I do. And I think it's interesting because, you know, when when you think about it at that time frame, when you're using the fax machine and you are building a network, it was very much around your ability to, you know, b- build your own proprietary network that you could leverage for your clients. The barriers to entry into recruitment, I think, have shifted so far downwards now because the, the talent is out there and you can connect via these social channels in order to find them. And so in, in some ways, it's, it's not as difficult, but the challenges have still remained quite high from the engagement standpoint. But no, I, I'm a similar time. So I went into recruitment in Hong Kong in 2001. So yeah, a, a, a few years ago. 
And, and the connection bit is something that I like to get a perspective on. You mentioned earlier on about LinkedIn coming into the picture. And of course, right now it's easier than before, easier than five years, 10 years ago in connecting with the talents out there. But still, according mm. to research, uh, this is something that came up from Robert Walters, 68% of tech hiring managers surveyed in Southeast Asia said it took them more than three months to fill an open tech position on their team. Is this something unique to technology or why hasn't the infusion of different platforms, different tools, new ways of doing things help to bridge this gap or even narrow the time to fill for all these companies? Yeah, no, no, that's a really good question, Adrian. I think I think when it comes to ta tech talent, it's, it's definitely um, a harder market. Now, part of that is because the talent pools are scarcer, but the demand is is significantly high. I mean, you look at somewhere like Singapore with the likes of ByteDance, so TikTok, Tencent, Zoom, all, all setting up here. The all, Already in what's a pretty tough market to source tech talent, it's getting increasingly harder. Now, LinkedIn's an interesting source because you know, a lot of talent is on there. But when it comes to tech talent, actually, when it comes to engineers, to be honest, they, they've been slower to adopt LinkedIn as a channel by either not putting their profiles on there or not having up-to-date profiles. So, you know, more specialist areas like Git, GitHub, they would they would contribute to. So I, I think it's a, an area where it is, it is very hard. And, and the secondary thing is, even if you're on LinkedIn, there's been studies that have found that a, a good engineer may get three, four, five, six approaches a day for different roles in Singapore through that channel. So fatigue sets in. And it's actually quite a noisy market to cut through and really be able to engage that talent there. Right. But having said that, of course, for any uh, tech talent that's struggling to find employment uh, by virtue of them turning up on LinkedIn, that definitely would help them to stand out among the quiet crowd in the market. But having True. said that, it would be interesting to really help companies better understand how they could really accelerate their acquisition of tech talent. And I believe that is something that you are attempting to address with something new that you're bringing to the market. No, exactly. And I, I think it's new in this region. I think one of the biggest challenges, so at GRIT, we, we focus purely and specialize in within the areas of digital and technology and really looking at how we can enable clients to tap into our network to identify, you know, to identify talent. I think often the, the, the challenge could be when you're going out to, it is, as, as we touched on, it is a very noisy market to find tech and digital talent. So with what we've launched, we've launched the GRIT talent platform where effectively we flipped the model around. And it's very much about us building a curated pool of talent within that area that is open to opportunities, but makes talent the priority. Because to be frank, with a lot of talent, they, they, don't want to be approached all the time around roles that effectively at the end of a process, they find out the salary is a mismatch. So what we've created within that is an anonymized curated platform of talents where companies can come in, they can search for talent based on, and this is where it's different to, to LinkedIn, they can search for talent based on notice periods, salary expectation. So, and that's important to note. So it's not current salary, it's salary expectation. A visa status, which obviously is an increasing focus here in Singapore right now, as in other countries. And and then approach that talent directly with the job that they have and the salary level that they're looking to pay for that role. And the talent then has the power to choose whether they want to engage in that job or not. Now, the benefits for that for the companies, that they know that they can actually access talent who are looking or open to opportunities in the market. And they know when they engage with them, there's a genuine interest in the salary parameters that are being spoken about or at the right kind of level. And from a talent perspective, it obviously means that they, they engage in a process with the role they're interested in. And again, the salary parameters, because there's so many pitfalls, I think, in recruitment, I'm sure you've seen over the years where a talent can go into a process, go through a, a whole process, and then find out at the end, there's a complete mismatch around salary. And to be frank, there is a tendency for companies also, when they go through a process to find out what a candidate's salary is. And if they're at the lower end, they will offer them a lower salary than if they had the same candidate with the same skills that are currently on a higher salary. So what we want to do is we want to remove the bias from that so that talent's paid what they are worth in the market, not what their current salary dictates, and also enable companies to shortlist in a much shorter time frame. So to your point, three months is a hell of a long time to wait for a to onboard or even to get to an offer stage with a developer. So within the GRIP platform, they can normally shortlist within 24 to 48 hours. 
and then start that process, which should reduce the, the hiring time significantly. What you mentioned actually reminds me of the premise of a modeling agency. So if you want to find a model, you don't approach them directly. You go to an agency and of course the agency will tell you, okay, this is what you want. These are some of the people you can speak with. And of course that turned, uh, that really closed things very quickly. And I, I'm just wondering, because given your background and I'm very certain from the from the initial premise, it is very attractive to look into, okay, let me let me look into starting another recruitment business, or maybe I'll just build a better ATS. What you have mm-hmm. as a marketplace is quite a unique proposition. What was the top process behind it that uh, a lot, that made you arrive to deciding on creating a marketplace instead of the other low-hanging fruit? Yeah, I, I mean, so, so when we when we launched Grit Search, or Grit, we, we launched with Grit Search, which is very much kind of a traditional model, but we use that as an entry into the market to really educate clients around the process. Because as you rightly mentioned, it's, it's a newer model and the hardest or the biggest challenge any business will have is when you're trying to change behavior in terms of what people are used to. And no matter what the price is, whatever the, the process looks like, people are comfortable in terms of what they know. So it's very important for us to go out there and establish credibility and building a brand within what people know and then then adopt this technology but but at grit we're very much focused on talent so talent for us is the priority so what we were looking to solve is how can we ensure that we actually keep the interests of talent you know front of mind because if we look after the talent if we engage and curate the right talents then we know there's a there's a demand in the market for for that talent and that that's where it came from so that there's businesses that you'll have seen i'm sure in in um, us and uh in Europe, the likes of, you know, Hired, Vetri, Honeypot, etc., that have adopted these marketplace models, and they've, they've become very successful. And the difference is we wanted to, again, put more power in, in terms of the talent's hands by anonymization. So this, this is a new thing. So that's kind of where, where the idea came from. But it's also looking at reducing the efficiencies or inefficiencies in a traditional recruitment process. Often when you're, you know, you're running a, a, a recruitment business, particularly a contingent recruitment business, you're, you're not filling or you're not enabling a lot of talent you have to actually get access to the opportunities. And what I mean by that is if you go through a process of hiring, say, for example, a, a product manager, you may surface 30, 40 talent that you think are good, maybe not for that role, role, role but good for that, ta- you know, good, good candidates. And you end up putting the 39 that you don't place on a database and they kind of languish there and they're not getting the, the best level of service. And also you're not able to give them access to more opportunities. So that was a concept where we thought, well, actually, we want to ensure that this talent does actually have access to more opportunities. And we actually want to ensure that companies get better value as well. Hence the, the fee rates that, that we charge are 60% lower on a contingent basis than a traditional firm. But we can do that through the adoption of automating processes, implementing and building algorithms that facilitate the AI and the matching. And by reducing those costs and automating those processes, we can pass those cost savings on to clients and by, you know, by virtue of that, put more opportunities in front of the talent. That's really great to know. As much as uh, recruitment agencies would be a service that many companies would sought after to help them quickly or hasten up the recruitment cycle. But having said that, as you mentioned earlier on, the high cost associated with traditional recruitment services has often been a barrier to entry for many smaller businesses. So it's good to know that Mm. you're able to reduce the cost uh, by 60%. And that definitely would allow more SME startups to really look into a different way of attracting and acquiring their talent. And something else that I'd like to also draw your insights on, obviously we are still in COVID and that has really radically affected not just on the tech talent side, but across different way of talent acquisition. Obviously, during mm. the initial phase one, companies were just caught with their pants down, not sure what to do, and hiring has, was frozen entirely. But right now, we are seeing pickup. But having said that, I am also seeing an inclination, and these are anecdotal from companies that are much more open to acquiring talents from outside of Singapore because since Singapore workers can work remotely, I could hire the same remote worker and have him or her based in Vietnam, for example. Mm -hmm, Are you seeing mm -hmm. a similar trend based on all the data that you're collecting right now? Yeah, and I think you're you're absolutely right. I think, you know, we we certainly are. And and this is a challenge. I mean, I think in Singapore, you know, the the success in terms of onboarding or or getting these, these large regional hubs, tech hubs to be based here 
is fantastic. The challenge is obviously, can you find all the right talent? And you can't locally. I mean, there's some great work that the government's doing around the Skills Future programs, the retraining initiatives. But to be frank, if you're hiring a, a software developer, it may be that you need someone that can come in tomorrow and, and do that and, and not wait for, you know, that, that pool of talent to build. And I do think it will over time, but that requires, you know, corporate engagement and government engagement to ensure that really, really happens. I think certainly what we've seen, though, is an increase in, in two kind of things over over you know the, the, the previous years is that organizations that are setting up tech hubs in in Singapore tend not to want to just rely on Singapore because the concerns of can they find enough people and also cost as well in terms of hiring and, and employing so uh, there's a lot of companies here even your small um, to medium size or companies going through a series a that are setting up multi-locational offices so they will have an office in the Philippines they'd have an office in in Vietnam to enable them to tap into to those as well. I think secondly, though, what we certainly found during COVID is, is this whole remote worker sort of adoption. Now, companies, I think, are trying to figure it out, to be frank, uh, but there's definitely an appetite to, so some companies are further ahead and able to say, well, actually, yes, if you can find us a great mobile engineering director here in Singapore, perfect, we'll hire them. But actually, if you can find, if you find someone, anyone in the, anywhere in the region, we will be in a position where we can bring them on board. So that's definitely a trend I think we're going to see. Not all companies yet have figured out, okay, how do we do this from a employee contractor arrangement standpoint from local regulations, tax, et cetera, et cetera. So there are some challenges to be worked through, but I think the appetite and the interest level of actually looking talent, not just regionally, but potentially globally, has certainly opened up during this, this COVID period. So it's going to be very interesting for the industry moving forward. And th this is one of the reasons actually as a, as a business, the platform for us is in Singapore, but we just incorporated in KL. We're about to incorporate in Hong Kong and then the medium term. So over the next year, we want to then incorporate in Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand and the Philippines and very much build a talent network across the region to enable this choice, not only for, for, for companies to hire, but also for talent to, to move around or, or, or have access to broader opportunities outside of their local uh, cities or, or countries. And definitely, I do agree that when it comes to the supply of talents, especially in Singapore for tech people, the, 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 the speed of the supply is just not there. Even at the university level, they can only churn out so many graduates in comp science on a regular mm -hmm. basis. And because of that, companies kept struggling to fill up their positions. And obviously, the top tier talent would either go to Silicon Valley or go to the Google in Singapore. Given your experience and your duration in Singapore, at a national level, what do you think we are not doing right in order to ensure that the gap between the supply and the demand could be closer and narrower? Yeah, yeah. I think I think if you look at somewhere someone like Silicon Valley or somewhere like Silicon Valley, and I had a chat with the CTO about this the other day, and I said, because interesting, KPMG came up with a study that Singapore has potentially overtaken Silicon Valley as the world's leading tech hub. And to be frank, he was like, well, the, the, the CTO at this point was, no, I, actually, it hasn't. And the, and the biggest challenge that Singapore faces, if you look at C Silicon Valley, there's kind of state funds there that actually enable startups to offer very good salaries to engineers to keep them there versus going to, say, Microsoft in Seattle. And that enables them to keep that talent and, and hire really good talent locally. One of the challenges Singapore faces is, you know, there are some clients here, or some, some customers or, or, or employees lawyers here who actually hire very good talent, tech talent, but the projects, they, they kind of, and they, and they pay good salaries, which makes it very difficult for that talent to justify moving out and doing more interesting projects or innovative projects that would advance the industry faster. So from that perspective and that particular CTO's perspective, he felt actually because of these larger organizations that weren't necessarily large tech focused businesses, but hired tech, good talent and paid well, it actually stopped Singapore from really advancing as innovatively as somewhere like Silicon Valley. And I thought that was a really interesting point. So I, I think that's one of the challenges that, that Singapore pay, you know, face. 
space. And I do think at the moment, one of the challenges is certainly around the, you know, the, the, the EPs. Can companies find EPs for foreign talent? Now, I'm a strong believer that opportunity should always go to nationals first in whichever country you're in, if they have the, the skills to do that role. Having said that, you look at the, the, the growth in technology, you look at the number of the regional hubs here, you know, Singapore will potentially benefit from if there are roles which are taking three, four, five, six months to fill and you can't find talent lo locally, you know, certainly there is a benefit to potentially bringing foreign talent in for those roles who can not only help that company to grow, but can also help broaden the skill sets of local talent within those particular areas to ensure that longer term um, sustainability within the country. So I think those are two kind of concepts uh, to grapple with if you're looking at really seeing how Silicon Valley operates versus, versus maybe Singapore. I'm still trying to process the report that you mentioned that Singapore has overtaken Silicon Valley. <laughs> I, yeah. I highly believe that is a research sponsored by EDB. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I'm not too sure. I just, it was actually KPMG. It was a KPMG report that said potentially, but I, I think I think most people would think, well, okay, it's, it's certainly not there yet. I, I, but I, I do think, like you said, that there are a lot more things that we could do. And many times when I look at all these new initiatives, like the most recent one, uh, not tech specifically, but I'm sure you're aware that yeah. it's building an electric car plant in the west side of Singapore. Yes. And no Singaporean has experienced building any cars, except mm. Tamiya toy cars probably and radio control ones, right. but not electric cars per se. And I don't see any degree master in electrical car building <laughs> that came up three years ago at university level. So by the time the, the plant is up, I, there may not be enough supply. It, it often seems to be a case where we jump over a cliff and then try to assemble the airplane along the way down. Yeah. That obviously created a lot of friction and problems. And then you have to bring in foreigners and then there'll be issues from the Singaporeans. And this is repeated time and time over and over again. But something I, I would like to get your thoughts on would be, mm. and, and I actually shared this discussion in a recent focus group, because most recently I've, I'm seeing companies driving such training initiative. So instead of, say, Google or Salesforce going to uh, NUS Career Fair to find the best comm science people, they would actually create their own academy. Salesforce mm -hmm. specifically, I saw their ad on Facebook. Uh, they have this their own academy where they'll train people to be Salesforce administrator. And of course, after graduating with the certificate, they will be hired by Salesforce. And of course, because yeah. it's Salesforce, as long as other companies uses the same thing, you will be able to transfer your value across. Same for Google, same for AWS, for example. Do you think yeah. that is a way to go for companies to lead the training initiative instead of being dependent on university to come up with updated curriculum? Yeah, I, I think, okay, I, I, and listen, it's a re really good point. It's something that obviously everyone's trying to grapple with or countries trying to grapple with right now around this whole retraining and what is the right way. And I don't, I don't think there's one right way. I think it has to be a collective movement across corporates and government. So government can drive initiatives with education and universities in terms of looking at how they can build pools for, for the long term. I think equally, though, employers do have a responsibility to their employees. And also, I mean, interestingly enough, from a financial perspective, studies show that if you were to go out and, and hire or rehire someone, the cost of business could be around 30000 If you were able to retrain someone within your organization, the cost of business would be 20000 Now, that requires time and effort, though. So I, I, I think it requires both. I think organizations like Salesforce and so on makes absolute sense. Let's train them to do this. And then, you know, we, we can build them and they can, they can build a career from there. But I also encourage organizations to look at, okay, internally, you may not be able to fill all your roles tomorrow that you want to fill. But who is your talent within the organization that, you know, people that you, you know, have done a phenomenal job for you in the past that you can actually invest that time in retraining? Because actually longer term, that would be better. I mean, it's, it's probably something that organizations should be thinking out anyway from a from an employee responsibility perspective particularly in the current climate but from a financial perspective it's also less costly than going out and rehiring so i, I think it was corn ferry said by 2030 there could be you know a three million deficit of professionals required across technology in, in apac alone now that's significant and i think a study out from 
Singapore government said there'd be a requirement for another 60,000 um, tech people in the next year or so. So you're not going to get if, if you're you're not going to get that tomorrow through looking to hire talent can do the job tomorrow. So I do think there has to kind of be a step back from organisations to look at how can they retrain their talent here and and really support the broader agenda as well. You mentioned earlier on that a grid will be expanding in many different countries and that would definitely be interesting for all these companies to look at in engaging your services beyond just expansion and bringing your marketplace solution to all these different markets. Are there any stuff on your roadmap in terms of product development that you would like to share mm. with the audience? I think what, what we're looking to do with with the Grip Talent platform is looking at how we can bring broader value to to the talent that's on it. So as an example, so right now it's about how can we enable companies very quickly and efficiently to access talent in an area where, where there's less supply right now and how can we put the power in the talent. What we also though want to enable talent and, and what we're working on is a if you look at areas like technology, hiring, it, it can be higher, harder sorry, to find people through the channels you have. And actually, a lot of it comes via referral. So again, we want to enable talent to monetize their network. So we kind of want to Uberize recruitment in a certain way, where we enable them to actually potentially get a secondary income from driving their own network and connections into roles that they think would be a good fit and of interest to to their friends, colleagues, peers, network, etc. And then we also want to you know, develop a platform into an area where you can actually get peer advice, where you can get career advice. So we see the GRIP platform over time becoming much more of a community-based social network that, yes, enables people to identify roles, but broadly enables talent really to seek advice to monetize to retrain upskill and learn and develop as well that's really nice to know and for software developers and companies looking to hire software developers that, that would like to try out grit where should they start if they just go to gritsearch.com you can very you can just set up an account very quickly and then you can start searching so there's no costs involved from a company side unless they were to hire so it's a success only basis so companies can go on there they can set up an account they can play around with the you know the the the, the channels they can identify talent and if they're in a position where they want to then reach out to them they can engage with them and grit will then support in terms of the interviews the feedback you know, Know, any offer management, you know, onboarding, much as you'd expect with a traditional firm, but the cost is is contingent based and it's sixty percent lower. And then for talent, equally, they can our, our sign up process is less than sixty seconds. They can drop in their their resumes. Um, we would then optimize that, anonymize their profile, and they can wait for opportunities to potentially come to them and and engage on those ones that they think are a fit. For people who are interested, I'll be adding the URL to gridsearch.com in the show notes. Paul, thank you so much for your time today. It has been lovely speaking with you and I wish you all the success with Grid Search moving forward. Thanks very much for the opportunity, Adrian. Thank you for listening to the podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to more information about our guests and their businesses. If you enjoyed this podcast, it will be helpful to give a review on iTunes or follow me on Spotify. If you're using Overcast, please hit the star button under the episode. That will help get this episode and podcast out to more people who may find it useful. I'll see you in the next episode of The Agent Han Show.